okay so uh again stop me at any time i'm i find it rather difficult to make this presentation because uh i didn't really know i mean there might be fairly beginners in the audience and there are there are very very much experts in the audience as well so you know I, i'll try and cover a little bit of uh the whole spectrum although i don't really go into the very complicated stuff um so just first of all pet and spect are functional tomographic modalities are, by the are there any mr people in the audience at all no ah yes good congratulations <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, with with a functional modality, you you want to measure what's going on in the body, right? And uh, we do that by injecting something and then seeing where it is, and ideally also tracking it over time. Uh, in MR, you can also do dynamic acquisitions, and you can vary your sequences, uh, and you can do spectroscopy and so on. So in CT, you could do functional, but only only dynamic contrast type of things. Otherwise, there's there's not much you can do. So that's sort of our, our claim to fame. We want to image uh, functionality, even if we do it badly in some sense because of resolution and voice measures. So all of this started with nuclear medicine a uh, long time ago, um, where you uh, have a single photon emitter that uh, you know this uh, radio tracer that is injected into the body and that uh, emits uh, gamma photons and you try and measure those then you have a whole detector around it which we're really not going to go into but originally this was done with planar imaging uh, so you get projections it's a little bit like an x-ray but uh so and that's still used in in a lot of cases so this is for instance for bone imaging and uh, it obviously is very useful, but in, in many cases, you want to do more than just get the projection. And we, we want to get them tomography. And that in, in nuclear medicine is quite old. Uh, and so here are some of the older scanner designs around. And amazingly enough, uh, for instance, the, the brain scanner, some of that technology is, is still, you know, people in Japan are making a, a helmet pet that looks a bit similar to this. So. Uh, it's hard to invent something new, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, it's it's been around for a long time. So you you could sort of wonder, well, what what happened since then? Well, there's a lot of detector development uh, improvements and algorithmic developments as well, uh, which is uh, sort of mo more the aim of uh, the course today. So uh, can get rid of this. Ah, you don't see it there. Good. Um, so I expect, uh, is, are there any spec people in the audience? One, two, three. Okay, so right, so for the pet people who don't know then. Uh, so we have the single photon emitted and we have our collimator and a detector. We need the collimator to find out where does the gamma photon come from? Otherwise you have no direction information. Uh, there, there, at some point, 15 years ago, there were some theoretical results that said the the best spec system has no collimator, but I don't think in practice that would ever work. Uh, so we have this collimator, you have it in very different shapes. Uh, this is a parallel hole collimator, but you can't do tomography with this. Uh, so you have to rotate it around the body. Right? So that's how this uh, works in practice. Uh, People do usually 360 degrees, but it can be 180 degrees or less uh, rotations. That just depends on on uh, on the organ and where it is, how you want to image it. Um, and, and okay, I'll just play this again. Uh, the uh, issue obviously is that uh, radioactive decay happens at random points. You don't know, and you can't inject too much. So we detect each of those gamma photons, and that will give us a lot of noise in the data. So that's different from CT. Okay, uh, right. So that's another picture of a spec scanner. Um, we have a resolution sensitivity trade-off. Uh, we want to detect as many photons as we can to get best possible images. 
And therefore, in clinical practice, the collimator holes are fairly wide to otherwise we stop too many of them. <laughs> and so clinical resolution sits around the one centimeter, uh, while in, in animal scanning, you can go below one millimeter or, or, uh, uh, or even 0.1 millimeter. You can, as long as you make your collimator holes smaller in some sense, you can usually bend on with pinholes, you can get arbitrary small resolution respect, but then you don't detect a lot of photons. Um, so also because of that, the durations tend to be fairly long for spect imaging. And you have so, sort of uh, weird radionuclides that uh, you might never have heard of before. Um, it's used mostly for cardiac perfusion, also for, for brain diseases. Uh, PET is almost the same, you know, we detect, we inject a radionuclide and therefore it is random. However, we'll be detecting a photon pair and it has different radionuclides and we have better resolution. So why is all of that? Uh, I'll give you a non to scale drawing of a patient um, where we see lots of uh, atoms and there is one suspicious one, obviously, uh, that's radioactive. And at some point unpredictable in time, it will uh, decay into a positron and a neutrino, that positron will travel around. It will uh, uh, see an electron get close to it. And then uh, this is travel is around one millimeter, depends on density. And then that uh, annihilation will give us two gamma photons, which we try and detect. So we just to make sure uh, the, the MR person in the room knows we're not detecting the positrons, we're detecting the two gamma photons. Right? Um, and uh, we could have some scatter that gives us trouble in the reconstruction. So how do we find out that we have two gamma photons? Well, we do something called coincidence detection. Speed of light is pretty high. Therefore, we can find out, uh, put sort of a, a window on the time <laughs> interval that they are detected. OK, I see you nodding. So that's great. So here is sort of a table comparing some of the, of the differences. Uh, between the two modalities. And there, that's a, a nice paper uh, discussing the difference between the two. Uh, we'll, we'll upload the slides on, on, on the link in the HackMD just after I've done here. Uh, okay, so what kind of data do we have? Well, in practice, all of the reconstructions you're going to do are histogrammed data where you count the uh, uh, number of photons that you have over a certain time interval. Right? There is also something called list mode data, which is just a list of all the photons that you detect. Uh, it, here it says coincidence because it's uh, in PET, but in, you can also do list mode spec, obviously, where you just have uh, the uh, detector position and the, uh, the angle and so on for all the, all the photons that were detected. Uh, we have uh, currently, in the version that we have, we have no list mode reconstruction, but the, the theory behind list mode reconstruction is almost identical to the one in the histogram reconstruction. Uh, the implementation is a bit different, but uh, a, a lot of the main framework is the same. So once you know how to do the uh, histogram uh, reconstructions with, uh, with SURF, you will also be able to do this about reconstructions with very little changes. Um, okay, so we, we often call them sinograms. I'll show that to you in, in a minute. It, it's somewhat terrible terminology and uh, sinograms in theory should be a 2D thing, but in, in PET, we have uh, a coincidence between different rings. And so you, you, you need to have information on which detectors you are, but also which rings you are. So you really have 4D information. And then you might have time of flight, so you have 5D information. Some people call that a sinogram. Other people call just a 2D thing a sinogram. So in our terminology, third terminology, sinogram is the 2D thing, although we're not always consistent. Question, yes. Uh, could you explain or give a bit more details between histogram and histogram? But you said it's almost the same, but... No, the, the, the theory, how do you reconstruct, but the data format is entirely different. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yes. So in in the list in the list mode file, you essentially that there are many different uh, file formats, but essentially for every event, so inspect for every gamma photon, and in PET for every coincidence, you record the two detectors in PET or the position and whatever inspect, and the timestamp, and you just have a very long list. Yes. Uh, while in histogram mode, you say okay for usually you say between those two detectors how many events did i see in my one minute that i measured yeah um, what kind of processing so uh, I'll, I'll come back to it yeah remind me if i don't <laughs> uh we have some the the data is more than just what you measure uh, to be able to do good reconstructions, you need to know something about that generation, which you'll we'll come uh, back to in a minute. Uh, but there's also something called, usually called normalization um, or calibration files. So your detectors are not working as well in different places, and you need to know that to incorporate it into your system. So all of this information you need to be able to do uh, good reconstructions. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so what does image reconstruction try to do in our context? Ideally, we try and get quantitative information of the radioactivity distribution, and that will then be in kilobackers per milliliter. We don't always go towards the final quantification, but it's always uh, uh, roughly related to that. There might be scale factors that uh, or, or maybe, oops, I'm sorry, maybe we don't put all, all corrections in there, therefore it's not really quantitative, but in principle, that's what we want to do. And in the good old days, we were using filter back projection, but not really anymore. So we're not going to cover that at all, only uh, iterative algorithms. So uh, to, uh, to understand that a little bit more, uh, I'm sorry, the, what the iterative algorithms are trying to do is sort of uh, say, I have an image that fits my data. I will come back to that. But to do that, I need to understand a little bit more about uh, how do I go from an image to the measured data. And so the, the simplest model that you can have is, is something called uh, line integrals. And, and this uh, is shown here. Um, if you have your uh, detector here and it doesn't rotate for a, uh, for a, let's say 20 seconds and uh, the collimator can only see photons from along this line, you over your measurement period, you will see an average of uh, the line integral here of all the activity, yes? That you see on this line of responses, sometimes called. And in PET, uh, similarly, you would have a coincidence between those two detectors. That source can be anywhere on the line of response, but they will still add to the same bin in the history. Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, if you if you have line integrals, um, you can do filter back projection, and therefore uh, that's where it came from. However. We don't really have line integrals. There's lots of other physics happening, uh, but uh, which which are uh, sort of the in two slides onwards. But before doing that, uh, the fact that you have line integrals means that you can go to uh, to sine groups. So our data is always related to lines. Yes, and so how do you encode line information? Into into a histogram, and so I'll show that in two D for a sine group, and you you will be able to see those images uh, once you do the demos and so on as well. Um, so this is simple simulation uh, where you have an image uh, that's just two sources here, and I uh, this is the corresponding projection where the system model or the acquisition model is only line in. That's sometimes called the X-ray transform terminology. Again, is is terrible because in really X-rays you do line integrals and then exponentials. But <laughs> the X-ray transform doesn't do the exponentials. Uh, 
uh, what can I say? Uh, so, okay, we need to find a line and compute the total uh, activity on that line. Now, every line can be characterized in many different ways, but if you think about sinograms, it is uh, characterized in terms of the angle of the line and the distance of the line from the origin. So if I uh, take my uh, a line that is also uh, parallel to the first one, but a little bit further from the origin, it ends up to a different point in my sign. So every point in my sign is one line. And the intensity that you see is the total uh, activity on that line. And if I move that line across, I see lots of zeros. And at some point, I will hit the other activity and I'll start to see some counts there. Yes. Now I rotate my line. If it's through the center, so the, the uh, horizontal axis here is the distance from the origin. And uh, the vertical axis is the angle. It will be at a different place here. But then when I go, I'll, I'll sort of poke around. Does that make sense? Uh, so you can do some of the, you can play around with the sources in some of the demos if you if you want to. Um, so uh, why is this called a sinogram? Well, if, if you really choose this coordinate system uh, and you compute the shape of this, uh, of this curve, it will be half of a sine and therefore it's called a sinogram. Now in practice, we don't really store the data uh, according to distance of the origin, because uh, our detectors uh, in PET are sitting on the ring and that distance is not, not uniformly spaced. So we, in practice, we store the data more in terms of indices uh, of the rings and, and of the detectors along the rings, but it sort of has the same shape. It's usually organized that it looks like this. Yeah. So we don't really have signs, but almost. And if you have uh, square detectors and so on, then you see block effects in all of, all of those sinograms, uh, which we don't have in the demos yet, although uh, we, we can do this now in STIR and therefore so. Uh, okay, any questions on sinograms? Good. Um, so fine, we have line integrals. And so a sinogram from a, a more complicated object might look something like this. Uh, I, I have some weird uh, gridding here that some JPEG artifact, I don't know where that comes from, but anyway, it, it, you sort of see, okay, there is a hot source here and there are some smaller hot sources there and so on. You can, you can do image reconstruction by eye if the data is not so complicated. Okay, but there is attenuation and scatter and randoms, which I'll, I'll talk uh, about in a minute. Uh, but in some cases, there might be one of the detector blocks that is out, and that gives you roughly a, a diagonal line. And uh, some of our, uh, the MMR, for instance, has a lot of gaps between detectors, and therefore our signings might look like this. So uh, that's already line integrals. It's not a very good model. If you're going to do image reconstruction with line integrals, we'll get into trouble. Right? You need to take all of this into account. And then finally, we have a lot of noise, yes? So our, our data will look like this. How are we going to reconstruct? Uh, so uh, mathematically, what, what we'll do is uh, have as an acquisition model for saying, if I know what the image is, what would my measured data be if there was no noise? Right? And uh, that turns out in our case to be in very, very good approximation can be done using an affine model. Uh, so you have a, what's usually called a system matrix here. So X is the image, it's a system matrix. And then there is a background term which uh, might contain <laughs> scatter for instance, uh, or, or other stuff. So uh, this is a model for the mean of the data. And then on top of that, we need to have a model for the nodes. Yeah. Okay. So in serve, the data itself is called acquisition data. You've seen that in uh, in Christoph's uh, demo earlier. And the uh, images are called image data, and the acquisition model called acquisition model. Good. So our acquisition model forward 
computes this whole operation uh, as long as you set the background term sensitive. Obviously, uh, you uh, you will have seen in CIL it's called direct because in CT you normally don't have the background term, and they chose a different uh, name. In surf, we can therefore use forward or direct it to give you the same thing. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so uh, a bit more than on, on the type of events that we can have. So in PET, I told you we have these coincidences, but uh, we also have scatter, right? And uh, we might have double scatter. And, uh, we might have scatter where one of the events goes uh, outside of the scanner or is uh, has reduced in energy such that our energy window will reject it. Or we might have scatter where both photons are detected anyway. Right? And that, that will be recorded in our list mode file or assign agreement. Somehow those scattered events we need to take into account. And then finally, specific to PET is we can have something that are called accidental or random coincidences, where there are two photons within, uh, sorry, two annihilations within the timing window, and we detect one photon of each, or maybe sometimes we detect three photons called multiples, and we need to handle that somehow as well. Uh, that the last case we don't have in, in spec clearly. Um, okay. Uh, so our, our prompts in PET are the true unscattered ones plus the scattered plus the randoms. And so our system model will need to have a, a model for all three of these components. Uh, so a bit more on the on Compton scatter. So we have the two cases. One is it just the scatter makes sure we don't detect it. And the other case is where the uh, I think there's an animation missing. Okay, the other case is where the scattered photon is detected. Um, so just for pet people, uh, well, I just had the uh, marking of my exam. A lot of people think that in inspect you don't have any scatter because you you sort of think about the first picture, but obviously there is no reason why the scatter can't get into your collimator. So you also have scatter inspect. And the uh, the ratios are not so small. You, you can have 10, 10, 20% of scatter inspect, and in whole body PET, you can have 30 or 40% of your counts can be scattered. So it's it's quite important to take this into account. Uh, so how do we model this? Well, in, in some sense, uh, oh, here is the, uh, the other animation coming a little bit late. Um, Uh, people often uh, write this in terms of attenuation and a scatter background. And there is no really attenuation in PET or SPEC because the energies of our gamma, gamma photons is so high that photoelectric effect doesn't really happen in the body. So you, you don't get absorption of your gamma photons. You only really effectively get Compton scatter, tiny fraction of uh, of coherent uh, scatter as well, but we usually ignore it. So why do we talk about attenuation then anyway? Well, attenuation is say, suppose I don't detect any scattered photons, I will have a loss in counts, right? I'll have loss for two reasons. One is photons get deflected, and another one is they are scattered, but they are rejected somehow, maybe with an energy bit. And that's what people call attenuation. So there is a difference in attenuation modeling between SPECT and PET, so I thought I'd quickly cover that. Uh, so we have our uh, single photon being emitted here, and the chance that this photon is uh, attenuated, meaning it's scattered somewhere along this line, is going to depend on the total density that you have uh, on the line from the source to your detector. Yes. Uh, so that means if you are closer to the detector, you will have less of a chance that you get scattered, therefore you will have less attenuation. And so your, your acquisition model for spec will uh, look something like this, in, uh, simplistically written. We have a, a sum of the voxel values uh, 
uh, on the line of response multiplied with an attenuation factor, which is usually computed from CT with exponentials and so on. And then you need to sum it for all the voxels on the line plus a scatter back. Yeah. Uh, so uh, why is that different in PET? Well, we have two photons and we need to compute the chance that both photons uh, uh, scatter. And so the first photon gives me something like the exponential of the uh, uh, line integral through my mu map uh, to, from the source to the detector. And the other photon gives it from the source to the other detector. But the total probability of, of survival uh, is the multiplication of those two. And then it so happens that these two things uh, get you the line integral over the mu map from one detector to the other. So in PET, your attenuation is independent of where you are on the line of response. Uh, and so your system model is sort of the same as the spec one, but it so happens that the A can be taken out of the sum. And so in the, in the spec notebooks, uh, I actually don't know if we have an attenuation map in some of the spec notebooks, Sam. Yes, we do. You have to set the attenuation image, but in the PET notebooks, you will, from the attenuation image, you compute the attenuation uh, factors, if you like, and then you add the attenuation factors. So that's this A thing to the system model as a multiplicative term. Yeah, so that's a big difference between the two. Uh, it, it is the historical reason why people uh, originally said, well, PET is quantitative and SPEC is not. That's because if you do filter back projection, you need to have line integrals. So in, in PET, what you can do is you can subtract your scatter, you can subtract your randoms, you can divide by attenuation, you can divide by uh, detector efficiency stuff. You only get line integrals and you can do filter back projection, but you can't inspect, you can't divide by attenuation. So the original filter back projection is not quantitative inspect. So you need to do um, the inverse of the attenuated radon transform, which can be done. There are formulas for it, but I don't think anybody is using them because we all switch to it. Okay. All right. So finally, I think it's time to go to uh, image reconstruction. Um, so the, the basic idea is now we have an acquisition model. So what are we going to do? We have an image that needs to fit our data as best as we can. Uh, and so <clears throat> we need to have some kind of criterion for what is the fit? How good is the fit? Uh, in practice, this is a very large problem. So we'll have to do this iteratively. So iterative reconstructions. Uh, I'm not iterative by choice, but just because of problem size and, and, and numerics. So we, we had our data here, but it's very noisy. So we, if we talk about get goodness of it, we need to take that noise into account. Uh, so it's a bit different from in MR. People will also uh, do iterative reconstructions, but uh, not really so much for noise reasons. Uh, depends on the sequence, obviously, uh, but more because of uh, non-invertibility of the of the matrix or so. Uh, but in our case, we do have to take the the noise criteria into account. So, how do we do that? We'll do statistical estimation. So the idea here, ideally, you say I have measured some data. Uh, what is the probability of having a certain image given that measured data? And then a good strategy might be to say, okay, I'm going to maximize that. I'm going to find the image that maximizes this posterior probability. Yes. Uh, now, uh, that is a bit of a hard problem, but Mr. Bayes came around and he said, well, we can turn that around to something like this. And the probability of measuring some data given an image is a much easier concept because that we sort of have done already. We have our acquisition model that goes from image to data. So as long as we now have a noise model, we can compute the first term. Uh, but these things are a little bit more problematic, right? Um, 
So uh, luckily the last term we don't uh, really need because it's, if we say we're going to maximize this, a probability of data doesn't depend on the image, so we ignore it. But this term is, is sort of prior information that we need to know what kind of images are likely. And there we need to do some hand. Okay, so because people don't like to do hand waving, the first approach is to do is to say, well, I don't know anything about this. I, I'm going to call this a constant and I'm going to do maximum lighting to reconstruction where this term disappears as well. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, where? Any uh, Zoom experts? Nope. Okay. okay. Uh, you're not in fair screen, so all the way in down the middle, screen arrow, down the bar, go away. No, no, because I'm sharing from my laptop. Uh, <laughs> don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, what I can quickly do is go out of screen share here, and then you see the bottom of the row. <laughs> How to get rid of the bottom bar. Yeah. Not like this, right? Yeah. Anyway. Is this the chat thing thing you're speaking of? Oh, maybe. On my computer, it goes down. Right? This is full screen. There yep. you go. Thank you. We can do anything, yeah? <laughs> I guess it goes the chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? All right. So what kind of model do we have for, for noise? Well, maybe the most obvious one is to say, I have a, a normal distribution and that might look like this. My measured data in the bins, right? So the histogram data, um, I take the logarithm here so I, you don't see the exponential anymore. Uh, minus the mean square divided by some stand, uh, standard deviation squared. Uh, that is the uh, probability, uh, the logarithm of the probability of measuring some data given the mean value and the mean value I compute by my acquisition. And so this stuff would be used uh, in MR. Uh, your data might be complex, and so you, you use a norm as opposed to a square, obviously, but otherwise uh, weighted. Um, uh, least squares is, with, uh, is most often used in MR reconstructions and often also in CT. Uh, so uh, in our case, the data is not quite normally distributed. It's uh, approximately Poisson distributed because we count. Uh, and so the, the formula looks a little bit different. Um, you have the data times the logarithm of the measured data minus the measured data plus some stuff which is irrelevant once you maximize it. That's just taking the Poisson distribution and taking the logarithm of it. So what we will be doing therefore is we uh, plug our uh, full projection into this that gives us a function of the image and that is what we're going to maximize. Okay. 
So the most common algorithm to do that is called MLEM. Uh, Andrew has a great uh, video on, on how that actually works and where it comes from. I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic algorithm in the sense that it's quite easy to implement. So there is an exercise for you to implement it yourself. And it's also theoretically, uh, it converges mathematically to the maximum likelihood solution. Uh, has been proven about in 10 different ways. I think if you uh, look at Jeff Pessler's book in progress over the last 15 years, he, every year he adds another proof. Um, so it's uh, theoretically nice, practically nice as well. And uh, we'll just have some formulas on that now, how it looks like. Uh, so it's an iterative algorithm. So I, I describe it in, in words uh, as opposed to formulas that might maybe be easier or maybe not, depending how you think. Uh, so when it says, I have my measured data and I need to compare it to my estimated data. Uh, and the estimated data I compute by a full projection of my current image, yes? Now the comparison in MLEM is a division. It's not, in, in other algorithms, you, you might have a difference between the two or something, right? But here we do a division. Uh, okay, so now we have a sinogram or, or acquisition data that ideally should be close to one. Uh, but we can't compute an image update from that. So what it does then says, I'll do back projection. And back projection is mathematically, it is multiplying with the transpose of my system matrix. So I have a acquisition data, I back project it, now I have an image again. So that tells me something about where is my ratio too large and where is it too small. But, uh, I have a normalization term here that says, okay, if it's one, I want to be this ratio, I want it to be one as well, because in that case, my measured data is exactly equal to my estimated data, and I don't need to change my image. Okay, so this ratio tells us something about how good does my data fit. And so what I'm going to do is multiply my image with this ratio. And you can sort of feel that this works if my image is too large. At the current uh, estimate, this ratio will be too small and therefore the final, sorry, the next new estimate will be a bit smaller and it will do that region, yes? So intuitively, I think this makes, uh, makes some sense. Uh, you mathematically also, it makes sense obviously. And I'm, I tend to think in terms of gradient algorithms. And so I've rewritten this formula here in an additive term, so it's a multiplicative uh, form over here. If I write it in an additive term, I haven't done anything. Uh, and then I look at this term over here, then I see that this turns out to be the gradient of my Poisson log likelihood. And uh, so then you see that we divide here because we have the uh, a gradient of a logarithm that gives us one over, right? So now you go and sit down during the coffee break and you convince yourself that this is just the gradient of the log likelihood. And what we have is a preconditioned gradient descent out. Uh, but it looks multiplicative. It makes intuitive sense as well. So uh, maybe what you can see as well is that uh, if we start with a positive image, because it's a multiplicative update, we'll, we will remain with a non-negative image at the very end. So MLEM tries to find us the maximum likelihood solution over the non-negative images. And that's because usually we don't want to have negative activity estimates. Yes, uh, It also stabilizes the problem a bit. Uh, <clears throat> in the additive term, that's not so obvious. And in particular, if you would add step sizes here, or so you have to be sure that you actually uh, remain in the non-negative region. Um, so it's a form of a, a constraint uh, gradient descent algorithm. Make sense? So if you, uh, no, maybe I'll, I'll do that. In a bit. So this is an example of how it evolves over iterations. So uh, you will, you are able to do some of this in, in the exercises. 
on the left is without noise and on the right is with noise. So I'll play this again. Yeah, and you, you see it sharpening up. So it's, we, we normally start with the uniform image uh, because we say we don't know anything. And then we do some iterations and we see it, see it gradually st uh, sharpening up. But we also see that it becomes noisy. Right? And so this was up to 50 iterations. So now I'm going to go much higher. And I'm, I'm going to display this on a logarithmic update uh, scale, yes, because otherwise we need to wait too long for uh, 8,000 iterations. Um, so you see that if there is no noise, nothing happens anymore. We are at the maximum likelihood solution. And if it's noise, it just keeps on going. And it goes to weird places in a way. And that is because your maximum likelihood solution is actually not very nice. And that is because our uh, system uh, model is actually ill-conditioned, right? So the, the system matrix gives us information on the image, but it doesn't give it uh, very uniquely in some sense. There's, there's, if there is some noise in the data, uh, you can fit a very noisy image to produce that noisy data, even if we know that the image shouldn't be so noisy. That's maximum likelihood has a problem. So what people usually do is they say, ah, I'll stop at 100 iterations or maybe 200. And there's a whole uh, discussion on, on that, on when you want to stop, which you are very welcome to ask later on. Make sense? Yeah. Is there a way to like, analyze such noisy images? Yeah, yeah. So in, in clinical practice, what people do is, uh, you know, on, on most patients, you, you can sort of figure out where is a visually nice image and you will stop there. And the second thing that people do is they apply a, a low pass filter to it, a Gaussian, Gaussian filter or something. Like that. If you apply your low pass filtering uh, amazingly because the structure of the noise is very salt and pepper-like, a low pass filter will clean that up dramatically, yes? In contrast to filter back projection gives you streak artifacts and they're much harder to get away from. But this, this noise you can, or a median filter or something like that, you, you can get rid of fairly easily. Nevertheless, it, it is a problem because even then, if you keep on iterating, which you'd want to do if you want to get good quantification out, uh, you, you are in trouble. So what can we do to, to penalize that? Uh, before we go there, uh, in practice, nobody's using MLEM because it's just way too slow. So we're, we're doing something called OSCM and the OS stands for ordered subsets. So I'll, I'll quickly try and explain that to you. So uh, MLEM says, I look at all the possible views. So this is maybe more of a spec uh, view. So you have your detector in eight different positions here. And every iteration, it's going to look at all the positions of your detector in this case. But OSCM says, um, that's too much work. I'm just going to look at a few of them to compute an update. Because after all, the uh, iterative update just says, look at estimated data for some of the views and do the ratio and the back projection. Whatever you have an image, you can do an update. And then in the next, sub iteration maybe you can call it or the next update you pick some other views and then you pick some other views and you pick some other views and ordered subsets goes through this in a cycle and uh in in a particular fashion that where the views are as different to each other as possible in some sense yeah so this this will clearly per update in this illustration here, we need to do one fourth of the computation. So our updates will be faster. And it turns out that this uh, initially certainly speeds up uh, the algorithms quite a lot. And that's the algorithm that you have on your scan. So why does this work? And, and this is, I attended a course uh, from Jeff Fessler uh, quite a while ago. And so he had an illustration like this. So suppose this is image space. We have 2D images in practice. We have million dimensional space, obviously. Uh, didn't fit on my laptop. So uh, this is the maximum likelihood solution. And the stars uh, are maybe, I 
chosen three subsets, so three sets of views, and I can compute maximum likelihood, my, <laughs> maximum likelihood solution for each of the subsets as well. Yes, every subset will have a usually, not necessarily, but usually unique solution. And so that will be somewhere else in image space normally. But if we start iterating very far away and we do an update towards the maximum likelihood solution, like the format that you saw earlier on is trying to do, it doesn't really matter into which direction we go. It's always going to be good, right? And if I compute my update uh, from the full data or one of the three, my resulting updated image is going to be almost the same. And that's going to uh, work very well until I get too close to the image. Because if, I, if I'm over here, I'm going to not find the maximum likelihood solution, but I'm going to find one of these three. And actually what happens is that you then turn into a limit cycle. You will go from one to the other to the other and one to the other and then so on, right? So OSCM does not converge, but nobody cares because we don't want to converge anyway because the image is maximum likelihood image is lousy. Right? So people will be stopping somewhere over here visually anyway. Yeah? Now, the ordered subset algorithms are very useful also for convergent algorithms, uh, but we, we don't really have time to go into that. Okay, so now penalization, we don't really like the maximum likelihood. So remember we said, we want to do maximum a posteriori, and we have this term here. So at the moment we have ignored the probability of the image. We've said it's constant, but we can try and put it in again. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that was our previous slide. And uh, just before I give you an example of a penalty, uh, I'm nearly done by the way. Uh, the, uh, this is my map formulation that I've just shown you. Uh, you can also think about it in a different way. You can say, I need to have uh, a distance metric that says how close is my uh, estimated image to the measured data and a penalty for images that I don't like. So these two are exactly equivalent, except there is a minus sign. Yeah? So here I'm maximizing, here I'm minimizing. So if you use SURF, you will be maximizing probabilities. If you use CIL, you will be minimizing distances. Uh, it's just something to be, to be aware of, but they're, they're uh, mathematically the same. So the trick obviously is to find a good penalty. Yes. And th there are many around uh, and the simplest one in some sense uh, is, and, and theoretically, nice to analyze, but maybe not so nice uh, images coming out of this, something which is called the quadratic penalty often. So but what you say is, uh, I don't really want to have uh, voxel values which are very different from each other if they are very close, uh, if spatially located. So you just take uh, you take in 2D, you would take a grid and with respect to the central voxel, you will take the top and the bottom and the left and the right, and you penalize the quadratic differences between those two. That will prevent the salt and pepper noise, and it's very effective in doing that. Obviously, what it will also do, it, it will uh, prevent you from having sharp edges in, in the image, yes? So it will sort of over smooth. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, you can uh, have other functions than quadratic. You can do a log cosh or, or TV or, or whatever that you like, where you say, uh, if these differences are very large, I think they are going to be an edge. That's the simplest thing you can do. And there are more sophisticated things as well, where you can say, no, uh, this I, I put some weights in front here where I've, I find information from an anatomical image or uh, or some other image that I have lying around that tells me where do I have edges. Those uh, uh, differences between foxes on one and the other side of the edge, I allow while within the same organ, I, I penalize them. And so we have an exercise on that, uh, doing a pet and inspect uh, 
information where you use the pet for the spectre or the, or the other way around. Like can or uh, also for MR multi sequence, this kind of stuff is uh, getting uh, quite common these days. Yeah, so th these are examples of penalties that we can put in. Obviously, another way is to say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and find that with deep learning, and you, you will have a presentation on that later. I think that's what I wanted to cover. Uh, I just quickly go over uh, some advantages. Uh, the advantage is because you have the penalty, you can iterate for a long time and your image will not deteriorate. I don't have a, a video on that, but I think there is an exercise that allows you to check that. Um, and uh, also theoretically, because you don't have the uh, in numerical and, and theoretical instabilities, you can do Taylor expansions and compute resolutions and noise behavior and so on. So that's all nice. Um, However, we have more, more choice and that becomes difficult. And then maybe we want to find penalties using deep learning, using training data. Uh, okay. Um, so just very short summary, uh, PET versus SPECT image reconstruction. Really, on, I haven't, in all the Maxim Likert stuff, I haven't had to tell you if it is PET or SPECT, it's exactly the same. So therefore the framework, the software and whatever that uses is exa exactly the same, but the system models are very different. And therefore the effect on the images is going to be different. The type of penalties, strength of penalties that you need to use is also true. Uh, noise is all important. It's all about noise control, different to what you have in CTN. Okay, that's what I had here. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So for a Boston algorithm, how do you normally decide the, the parameters like iterations and subsets? Yeah, so uh, for the people at the back, the question is for OSCM, how do you decide on the number of subsets and the number of iterations? So in, in, in clinical practice, um, it usually is up to the clinical physicists to, to do that kind of optimization in conjunction with the uh, uh, the physicians and you go to every center and they'll have some different preferences because the physicians like different image quality. Uh, and then they buy another scanner and then they say, well, oh, these images look lousy and it takes two years before they're used to it. So there is no, uh, nobody has a hard and fast rule is this is how you should do it. Uh, from, from a physicist perspective, the more iterations you do and the less subsets you have, the better you are, because you get uh, you get better quantification. You're not dependent on which image you started off from. Uh, you, if you have small sources, you can spend more time digging the small sources out. There is a there is an exercise on that, but in practice they are time limited, so that's not what they will be doing. So they will use a fairly high number of subsets and not too many full iterations. So Siemens is these days a, li a little bit. Uh, uh, strong on that perspective, they, they use very few, uh, while GE chooses by default, chooses a bit more that depends also on, on scanner characteristics and so on. And then every center has their own preferences. So there's, I have no good answer. Um, it's it sort of, it, uh, you know, the there was originally filter back projection and then OSCM came around and it took five years before it was taken up by the clinicians because the artifacts that you see between the two are very different and they have to train their neural network to get used to it. And it's the same for subsets and, and so on. So you, you get used to a certain quality of images and therefore you can't really change it anymore once they're used to that quality. Yeah. With more compute, can you then expect to go to non-subset or is that amount of compute so large? Um, even in well, unfortunately, our scanners get bigger and bigger and we, we have a talk on total body pet, so computation power there is a problem. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, in actually in, in our current software, uh, because of uh, lim computational uh, 
well, implementation issues. If you use the GPU projector, it turns out that it's better to use no subsets than, than with subsets, just because the way that we organized it. And I know we're stupid, but, uh, but anyway. Um, so I, I think it is possible, but we've done uh, a, lo a lot of work and not only us that you can use subsets, but you have to use them in a slightly different way than OSCM and still converge, right? So actually, uh, it computationally, you're always going to win if you use subsets and it's called stochastic optimization. You don't go in a certain order, you pick them randomly, but you take previous history into account. So OSCM doesn't know about history, but if you remember what you did previously, you can make this converge theoretically as well. And then computationally you win. So I don't think people will ever go back to one subset of algorithms. Yes? You mentioned that for OSEM, it doesn't fully converge because the, the, the different subsets have different optimizations in the interface. And then you mentioned that this is this is worse for noisier data, but I thought like the memory and specifically uh, for noisier data converges on very noisy images. So yes. That yeah, that's true. So, so I, I, again, I'll quickly repeat the question. Uh, so OSCM limit cycle is worse for noisy data, but MLEM converged image is also worse for um, for noisy data, but the OSCM one is even even worse, <laughs> you know? So if you, if you do, let's say 1000 updates, your MLEM image will be very noisy, but the OSCM one will be complete nonsense at that point. And if you apply strict OSCM, you can even have a zero image because it introduces zero where you don't want to have them. And you, uh, because it's a multiplicative algorithm, you can never get away from it. So, and so uh, it's, yeah, you have bad and even worse. But if you, if you have a penalty, so you can, uh, yeah, I, that's something that I quickly wanted to say. I'm running wildly over time, but uh, it's a good discussion. Um, where was the MLEM formula? Here, right. So this is a preconditioned uh, additive form of MLEM. So if you now have a map, what you would be doing is you don't compute the gradient of the log likelihood, but you compute the gradient of your complete objective function, right? So there will be, if you like, brackets plus gradient of penalty here, right? Uh, and then you can still use the same preconditioner and then you have something called preconditioned gradient descent format. And that is, uh, if you then put a subset version of that, you get BSREM and that's what GE is using on, on their uh, uh, reconstruction algorithms with QClear. Um, so um, if you use map, noise is not so much of a problem and therefore, uh, you uh, you can do more iterations, um, but if you then use normal ordered subset variation of this one, it will still have a limit cycle and it will still have more noise than the one subset version, unless you do the stochastic variance stuff. Okay, so there's, there's bad and there is even worse. Yeah. Okay, I, I think I should, probably stop and I believe we have a, a coffee break.